Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Channel 781 News Debrief. Uh, this week, we'll be covering a couple of weeks of the City Council. We're going to be talking about a um, uh, resolution by Colleen Brad MacArthur uh, looking to uh, make our building codes more energy efficient um, that got shot down. Uh, we'll be talking um, about uh, the full length of that. Um, we're going to be talking about a uh, sober house that was meant with contention uh, during the permitting process that started uh, this past Monday. Uh, we're going to be giving an update on the tenants' rights ordinance that showed up way faster than I thought it was going to. Um, and, uh, in a new uh, fashion. Um, and we're also going to be talking about the pride resolution that uh, was just in the uh, city council on Monday and who signed on and who did not. Um, as well as uh, we're going to have some um, special guests talking about pride, which is this Saturday. Um, so joining us uh, today is our uh, usual Josh Castor. Hello everyone. Tom Benavides. Hello. And we are joined um, by our regular Amanda Kennedy. Hi. And first time on our show, but avid watcher of our show, uh, Nicholas Hammond. Hi. Um, so they're here to talk about Pride, but Josh can introduce that for us. Sure. So this year is the third year that uh, Waltham will be having its own Pride celebration. It'll be the second year that it's on the Common. That's this coming Saturday coming up. So to talk about it, we have someone who I can't believe hasn't been on our show before because he's a good friend who's a lot involved in a lot of cool stuff in Waltham. Um, but he's been one of the main organizers of Pride since it started and has done a lot of work to make it happen this year. Uh, welcome, Nick. Hi, thanks for having me on to talk. I'm, I am a fan, so it's like exciting to be here. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to have finally have you. So can you just tell us about what to a little bit about what to expect for Pride this year? Yeah, sure. So um, Pride, Waltham Pride is going to be happening on the Waltham Common on Saturday, June 3rd from 11 a.m. to 4. Um, it is only the second year we've had it on the Common. And if you were at the event last year, this year's event will look a little bit similar, um, but there'll be um, some additional things that we that we didn't have last year. So uh, just in case you weren't there at all, it's usually there's some speakers um, like queer people and activists and um, people um, sharing their experiences uh, from Waltham who will be speaking. There'll be some performances um, from like singers, songwriters, drag performers, all like within like the greater Boston area. And then this year we're also gonna have um, a couple of food trucks which we didn't have last time. So uh, Chubby Chickpea is gonna be there, Gourmet Creole, and Uncle Joey's cannolis. We're also going to have a face painter and a bunch of other organizations and vendors are going to have booths and tables uh, spread out throughout that space. So that's kind of around that um, gazebo space on the common. That's great. And it looked like a lot of the speakers are young people. Can you tell more about a little bit more about who the speakers are going to be? Yeah. So last year, um, one of the goals going into this year for Pride was to like make sure we're being as like inclusive as possible and just like making sure we're like um, trying to get people from like diverse ages, uh, ethnic backgrounds, things like that. Um, because, you know, last year um, it was kind of like a small kind of group of people that were mostly like friends already who kind of organized it or a lot of people knew each other at least. So hopefully each year we get a little bit better at like including new new people. And so um, this year we had at least one um, Waltham High School student on the uh, organizing committee and we're gonna have at least two um, speakers who are both members of, I, I believe it's the Waltham um, um, GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance. I think that's what it's called. So they're, they're gonna be speaking um, as well as a couple other people. Um, uh, there's gonna be someone from Brandeis who is part of the um, gender and sexuality uh, uh, group. There's gonna be actually a Reverend doctor from one of the uh, Waltham churches who does uh, work with like and is very like queer friendly. So we're gonna have speeches from like, hopefully a variety of different people that um, their experiences and their what they have to say can like speak to different uh, members of the audience there. And uh, this is important I, because uh, we all, now that all these local prides are starting, we wanna avoid some of the mistakes made by pride in the past. So where's the money coming from for this pride? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Thanks for asking that. So right now, all our money that we have to pay for, we pay all of our performers, we are we, um, we have to pay for some things for like promotional items, we have to pay for 
you know, bathrooms and a dumpster. So all that stuff is coming. It's all community, uh, you know, funded. So we actually don't have any corporate sponsors. We have, or we don't have a, we don't actually even have a way to like officially sponsor Waltham Pride because right now we're not an official um, established nonprofit organization. So right now we have a GoFundMe. And if you um, are interested in contributing to that, you can go to walthampride.org slash donate, I believe, or you can just go to walthampride.org and there's a big um, donate button on the website. So yeah, everything that we've used to fund our events or anything we need to buy, um, that's all coming from like members of the community. And, uh, you know, we ran one fundraiser and it was pretty successful, but everything else has been mostly through like word of mouth and like social media. So we really appreciate, we've collected, we've, we've been able to collect a lot of money, um, but uh, we can always use like donations for things that sometimes come up last minute. This is only our second year doing it. So we didn't have like a super great idea of like exactly how much money we were going to need for everything. Um, and also uh, we're going to be selling t-shirts. So I'm wearing right now the pride t-shirt. It has like a big Waltham pride logo on it. It's this nice blue color. Um, we're, we, but we do have a limited supply of those. So if you are interested in getting one of those, um, you do actually have to come to Waltham Pride and those are going to be 50, being sold for $15. So that can be bought through either cash or through the GoFundMe. Um, if you if you donate and just show us the receipt, you can receive one of those as well. That's really great. So that's an important point to make because we've heard in the national news recently about big corporations who want to support the um, LGBT community and then uh, want to pull back that support as soon as a minority of bigots complains about it. So the way to avoid that is just to fund it ourselves. And it's pretty amazing that that's worked for the third year now. So everybody who's watching, if you can afford to make a donation, please do. Also, is there more help you need in terms of volunteers for the event? Um, that is a good question. So, uh, but before I answer that, I want to go back to what we were just talking about for a second. Just say that there, there are some like local, um, businesses that have been helping us and we don't have a problem with that, but what, like what you said, like there are some issues right now with like really big companies being like, we put a rainbow on our, our on our logo and, and then they don't actually do anything to help, or they actively hurt the queer community with where their money is going, especially like political donations. Um, we've had a lot of great support from, um, local businesses, um, I can't even just name them all because I don't want to leave every anyone out. But um, I just I do want to mention that like if it, if it's like a Waltham specific smaller business, we're definitely um, we we definitely have some good relationships. But um, yeah, as far as volunteers, there is a volunteer form on the Google. Uh, I'm sorry, on the website walthampride.org. So if you're interested in volunteering, you can fill out that form, and I'll ask you like when you're available and um, what you're interested in doing. And this year, we're really lucky. We actually had a ton of people reach out and say that they're interested in volunteering. So we have a pretty good um, number of volunteers and I think we're going to be covered for everything. But um, if you're interested in volunteering and you really want to do it, like just fill out the form anyway. And we'll, you know, if we have too many help, we're like, there's, there's, we're never going to have too much help. So I think the areas where there'll always be need is just in the morning, the hour before the festival starts, um, we can always use help getting people set up. So there's going to be lots of organizations and vendors setting up tables, they might have to carry it from the parking lot because the space by the um, city hall is pretty limited. So that could be a help for us if people just wanna help, like literally just like physically carrying tables, helping people get set up, get those tables assembled, whatever else needs to be done. And then just clean up at the end of the event. Um, at 4 p.m., the event officially ends, uh, but we wanna make sure we leave the Waltham Common like as you know clean as we found it. So there's gonna be probably a lot of trash generated from just like water bottles and food containers and stuff like that. So we just wanna make sure we get all that cleaned up. So um, you know, we don't leave a mess, a mess behind. So if you're interested in helping with that, um, you will also get a, a special uh, Waltham Pride shirt that says volunteer on the back and it's a different color. It's a purple color. So um, we have enough of those for all our volunteers who signed up and we have a few extras for anyone who wants to sign up to volunteer between uh, now and June 3rd. And one of the great things about this now being a repeat event that people can look forward to is individuals and organizations besides the central organizers can come up with their own ideas and contribute their own things. Um, Waltham Public Library has been awesome in terms of bringing um, their own ideas and their own programs in. And Amanda is here. She's been our show, on our show before to talk about gender justice issues. And she is part of a group called Waltham Gender Justice. And Amanda, can you tell us more about what you have planned for Pride? 
Yeah, so we are very excited um, that, to be able to partner with Pride, and we are hosting um, our second fundraiser. We are raising funds for Tides for Reproductive Freedom, which is a, a new uh, Massachusetts abortion fund um, started by and run by queer and BIPOC folks in um, mostly in Western Mass, but with folks all over the place. Um, and so we are going to be doing uh, an event called Paint Your Pride um, at Pride. And um, if folks have been to like a paint night or a paint and sip kind of event on the sort of what we're styling out off of where you follow a professional artist who will show you how to paint um, something of your choice. Um, so uh, we are the the it's sort of a customizable painting, which is really cool, which is not typical for a, a paint night. Um, everyone will be painting the Moody Street Bridge, but the background of that bridge will be customizable to the pride flag of your choice. Um, so you can do a rainbow background, you can do the trans fly, flag background, you can do um, any option that you want. Oh, I just found out that I could screen share for you and show you a little sneak peek of our painting. Give me one second. Sorry about all my open tabs, um, but you can see our uh, our beautiful um, customized uh, Moody Street Bridge. With this is the rainbow background, just as the sample. But again, you can change this to any of the pride flags that you want. We'll have um, images of the different pride flags. You can see all the colors, and you can make your choices. Um, and we are excited to have a professional artist that is going to guide this. So just um, to preempt anyone's questions, you do not need any artistic ability. You don't have to have ever painted before. You don't need to bring any supplies with you. We will have everything you need, including someone very talented to help you do this. Um, and you can, at the end of the day, take home your painting with you and post it somewhere in your house um, and have uh, your um, beautiful Waltham Pride memory um, and match your t-shirt maybe uh, that you've also bought at Pride. Awesome. Thank you, Amanda. I hope that's successful. It's very important for people interested in LGBT rights and people interested in gender equality to collaborate because they're essentially the same issue when you look at the people who are against them and why. Uh, Nick, do you have, are there any other activities we haven't talked about yet that you want to hype up that are coming to Pride? Um. So there's going to be stuff throughout the, the event from 11 to 4, but I do want to mention um, that uh, the social media is just kind of posted out like kind of like a general um, timeline of when things are happening. So if you want to be there for a specific time, I do want to say that if, you know, you can't be there for the whole day, the drag performers are all happening at the very, they're kind of like the, the finale. So the, the three to four hours when you're going to see all the drag performances and those were really fun and probably like the biggest highlight for me last year. Um, but also the food trucks, we had to kind of um, guess how many people that they need to serve and we didn't want to guess too high and then um, have them have a bunch of leftover food. So if you want to come for food, definitely come early. So, it, you know, if you want to come for food, come a little bit early. If you want to come for drag, come a little bit later or, or just stay the whole day. Um, the last thing I want to say uh, before I have to go is just um, if you're interested in getting involved in like planning for next year or, um, you know, like if you have feedback and you want to give, like just reach out to um, the, either me or go to the walthampride.org and um, there's uh, an email and just like let us know that you want to get involved for next year because we're definitely looking to try to like uh, build our team and also like make sure we're getting everyone who wants to be involved uh, involved if, if they if they can be and especially if, if you're like um, you know we want to have a more diverse kind of uh, committee leadership uh, team and planning committee so thank you. Hey, I just want to mention so the there was city council passed a resolution recognizing Pride Month. That's the third time that's happened. The first time was our friend Christine introduced it, I think in 2019. And there was one last year. Um, so this year it was introduced by councilors Bradley MacArthur, Paz and Darcy. Um, and the committee voted to approve it without um, 
committee, uh, the council voted to approve it without committee reference, which is good. That doesn't happen very often. It's usually for resolutions where they're very non-controversial. So it's nice that this is non-controversial, especially because the text of the resolution actually mentions homophobia and transphobia and the fact that this is a response. So it's not just trying to talk about the positive, it's trying to talk about the negative too. One interesting thing though, was at the meeting where it was uh, discussed, they, they, those three who introduced it gave the opportunity for others to sign on and no one else signed on. So that surprised me. I don't want to be too negative about it because I'm glad they passed it and they did it without committee reference, but it surprised me because there have been other counselors I feel like recently who seem like they were supportive of pride and, and have done things to indicate they're supportive of pride. And I, I just wonder what it was about this resolution where they were okay with voting yes on it um, but not putting their name on it. Um, Chris, did you have any thoughts on that? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm very disappointed that not all city councilors signed on. Um, many city councilors would talk about uh, when it's their resolution, the need for a unanimous council uh, to send out um, a resolution and how it's very important for that. And especially if you support that, then there's no reason for you not to sign on. And so for for this resolution to not have all city councilors sign on, especially when, um, like last year, I, I don't remember if it was unanimous, it might have been, I don't, I don't know. What I can say is that more councilors signed on to it. Um, and uh, so for, for them to sign on last year and then for LGBT rights to be more contentious, more stepped on um, this year and for them to not sign on, I think it says a lot about that person. Um, of course, it, it should be said that, you know, this is an election year and that's going to get dicey. So it might have more to do with like the municipal drama than like the national drama, but all, all of it, it's just, it's just all, um, it's all just a shame to see not a unanimous uh, city council um, promote LGBT rights in Waltham. Um, Oh, yeah, but I mean, it did pass. Uh, what I what I wish would have happened was that Colleen would have called for a roll call because then you would have had to vote on the resolution. Now, and I'm, I'm disappointed that that didn't happen uh, because uh, it was by a voice vote, which is what most uh, things do. But you can't see who voted for what. Um, yeah. And so I uh, I wish she had done a roll call um, and it passed. I mean, it passed. Waltham, you know, yeah. is recognizing pride. That's sweet. Um, but I mean, we live in Massachusetts, so I think we should be going the extra mile. Um with that um and from a uh a personal standpoint for pride um, i'm very excited for pride um talking about lessons learned um we yeah we have more shirts i feel like last year we made like 25 shirts because we weren't sure how many people were going to buy them and they were gone in literally like five seconds so we have more than that but we will probably still sell out um as as well as food like last year um like on the fly, like there was no food at all. And last year on the fly, like I, I called up, I think Waltham Pizza, I was like, can you just bring 10 pies to the Waltham Common? They, they were like, that, that's fine. <laughs> they thought it was weird that I was even asking. Um, and so uh, we just gave it away. And so I was like, okay, this should hold us over. I brought it to a table, like two minutes later, it was all gone. I called them again, I was like, can you bring 10 more pies of pizza, please? Um, and so I'm very happy we have food trucks, people should be fed, um, I'm really just excited that this is the, the momentum is uh, continuing for this. And yeah, just to plug for, for next year as well, it's just a very unique opportunity because like we, we have no corporate sponsors, we're not a nonprofit. This is just people in Waltham organizing a Waltham Pride. Like if you have opinions about what we should be doing differently, what we do should be doing more of, that your opinion will literally uh, change what we do next year because, because there, it's, it's small enough right now the organizing committee that all uh, opinions are heard and it's it's an exciting time it's an exciting project that you know in a few years it's going to have a little more bureaucracy i'm sure so this is a very unique opportunity to get involved in um in queer activism and i think amanda had wanted to uh say a couple more words 
Yes, I just wanted to say um, uh, a scheduling piece. So Nick mentioned that um, there's a ton of like cool drag performances at the end of the day at Pride. If you're really wanting to see those, but you also want to paint, we're actually doing three sessions, one at 11, one at one, and one at three. So you can kind of schedule it, fit it into all of your other Pride activities, come get a little like break from uh, the crowd, sit with us, hang out with us for a little bit. Um, so please look for that. We're also pre-selling tickets at a little bit of a discount because um, we are in what is known in the abortion world as Fundathon, um, where during the months of April and May, um, the National Network of Abortion Funds matches donations, which means that your $20 pre-sale ticket is actually $40 worth of donation to our abortion fund. Um, we're also throwing in a free raffle ticket because we're raffling off um, some great local Waltham business gift cards as part of um, our fundraising. And um, so that's like logistical things. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that abortion is often thought of as like a women's issue, um, but it's really an everybody issue. It's any anybody can um, experience, you know, things around reproduction and abortion is really fundamental health care. Um, trans people and queer people often have some of the hardest time seeking abortion care uh, just because of the amount of homophobia and transphobia that they face in the medical field. Um, and so having funds like Tides um, that really understand understands those issues is really, really important. Um, and so just bringing the issue of abortion into queer spaces to make it more accessible for queer folks, I think is really important. And so um, we're just excited to be able to do that here in Waltham. And that was the last thing I wanted to say. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much for Nick and Amanda coming on. I'm very excited uh, for Pride. We're going to be there um, all day, I think. I think uh, if you're volunteering, you're in a see me and Josh, who I think are coordinating that. Um, and if you sign up for the one o'clock painting um, activity, I think I will, that's the, the time slot I will be as well. Um, so yeah, looking forward to hanging out with everyone. Thanks for coming on, guys. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, okay, so next we're going to go into the city council um, meetings that we've uh, got to catch up on. Let's talk about the tenants rights ordinance first um uh because that was a continuation of we've been talking about this for weeks now um so tom please what is the update for the tenants rights ordinance yeah the biggest uh news about the tenants right tenant rights ordinance is that it has now expanded now that jonathan paz has officially proposed an ordinance to put in front of city council it is now an expanded law called the, or an expanded proposed law called the Housing Rights Notification Ordinance. And the way it is expanded is that formerly as put forward towards WAC CDC, they wanted a law that would protect, protect renters from eviction. So that way they would uh, be notified of their rights and resources that they have prior, prior to being evicted. So that way they can pull on those rights and resources. Um, but now this, proposed ordinance, the housing notification rights ordinance also includes homeowners who are at risk of foreclosure. So that whoever the foreclosing owner is uh, for the person living in the house that they formerly owned, they will also have those rights if this law passes where they, I say they will have those rights. This, this law doesn't give any rights, but they will also have this benefit of being guaranteed notification of their rights and resources if they are served a foreclosure notice. And as always, renters will be notified of what their rights and resources prior towards being served an eviction or being notified that even if they just have to leave, even if it isn't an eviction. Um, so the specific language is that when a landlord or foreclosing owner serves the tenant or former homeowners any notice to quit or notice of lease non-renewal or expiration, such landlord or foreclosing owner shall at the same time also provide the tenant and former owner with up-to-date notice of basic housing rights and resources. Um, and this would be at least 30 days prior to the lease ex expiration or non-renewal. Um, so yeah, that's the biggest news. And the city council didn't have a lot of discussion on it. Um, Jonathan Paz basically proposed the ordinance alongside, I believe, Colleen rather MacArthur, she may have also signed on uh, so those two brought this ordinance forward, and the only thing that happened at last city council meeting is that it has, that there is now scheduled a citizen input hearing, so that way people in the community can come on a public forum and speak 
in favor or in opposition to this proposed ordinance. This is scheduled for Wednesday, June 21st at 6.30 p.m. It is in Government Center, so 119 School Street, I believe. Uh, so if you are available, uh, it would mean a lot if you could come and speak to support um, this housing rights certification ordinance so that people can be notified of their rights and resources prior towards being forced out of their homes. That's awesome. That was a great uh, synopsis of what happened. Um, yeah, so last debrief I said is that this was uh, that they that Jonathan said he would plan to reintroduce it and that um, and that it would be up to watch and, and Jonathan to decide when to do it. I guess they decided just immediately. They first chance they had, they just said we're just gonna immediately do it. They wanna they wanna see um, movement on this. And so they uh, introduced the, the ordinance and then uh, scheduled or moved to schedule the um, the public hearing and then Kathleen McMiniman uh, who's who did not apologize? I was I was like I was like there's like a five percent chance that she can apologize. Uh, she did not apologize for the weirdly racial comments um, and outbursts that she had the last time. Uh, but she was very professional and said uh, I I knew this was coming and I scheduled the meeting. Um, what's what's interesting to me is that it was on a Wednesday, um, and in you know there haven't been a lot of citizen input hearings recently, but in the past. Uh, in like in like 2017, there were a few 2017, 2018, and they were like the beginning of of the city council meetings. And so, like, unless there's like a bunch of public hearings at all the city council meetings uh, moving forward, because she said like, oh, because of short notice and the the schedule is full. Unless there's a bunch of public hearings in front of these meetings, like, I really don't understand why they just didn't have it in front of the city council. Um, but I mean, it's happening. It's on Wednesday. Uh, and again, we talked about it last year. This does not require uh, a public hearing. It does. Um, it does not require this public input hearing. Um, but it is going to be very useful uh, for it to pass if um, a lot of people show up and and speak in positive uh, ways about it. Um, and uh, just for um, uh, just for a procedural thing, it's a citizen input hearing. And so the difference between that and a public hearing is that there's going to be no back and forth between the people that talk and the city and the city councilors. I think they might have an opportunity to say words at the beginning and they might have an opportunity to say words at the end. But like based solely on the rules of a citizen input hearing, that is just a time for people one at a time to go sit, uh, to stand and say words about the uh, about the ordinance. Uh, for and against, and then leave. And like, that's it. There's no back and forth. It's just saying words. You can't ask questions. It's just say words and then leave. And so uh, we're looking forward to that. I mean, it's in it's in government center. So we know that, public, that Waltham Public Access uh, can, um, local access can record there very easily. Uh, we don't know if they're going to. If they do not, we will record that ourselves. Um, and, and yeah, uh, I'm excited about it. I'm really so it's also again, and we talked about it last debrief. This is like the floor of responsibilities. Um, we're giving us a lot of time and energy because that's what the city council is talking about right now. But this is like a very, very, very small ask, and so I'm excited for building on this towards some actually like strong tenants' rights ordinances. Um, but this is like a good starting point. This is like the floor. Yeah. And it is very funny that you mentioned that because you mentioned that, like, you know, this isn't required to get this ordinance passed. So this input hearing isn't required. And it's just funny to think back, like, the reason this happened is the, in the first place is because Jonathan Paz wanted that uh, someone from Watch would be allowed to come up and speak to, like, inform the Ordinance and Rules Committee about how this ordinance works. And then uh, Kathy Ann Harris said, no, we're not going to have Watch speak at this meeting. If you want watch to speak, schedule citizen input hearing. And that has snowballed into this huge thing yeah. where now, like the biggest thing happening right now is that you know we have an opportunity for the whole city to come uh and speak up about how they feel about this housing rights notification ordinance. Yeah, so this is kind of weird thing where like you know it's not a necessity of getting this law passed. It is sort of just like another barrier that had had been placed in the path of this ordinance getting passed that we are now coming up on. 
Um, but because that is so important, like, you know, this is a barrier that most other ordinances do not have to go through. Um, the citizen input hearing is very important, has many uh, voices come to speak as possible in favor of this, because that appears to be the higher standard that has been set uh, for, as you described, this bare minimum tenant rights uh, or housing rights notification ordinance. Um, so please show up if you can. Uh, and if not, please email your city councilor in support. Yeah, no, if they're if they're if they're gonna go through all of this to like slow this down, if they're gonna require this to have a public input hearing, I'm hoping it's just a slam dunk uh, in favor of it. Um, and also you can talk if you want, it's totally within the purview of the citizen input hearing to talk about the process of the tenant rights ordinance. So if you have any opinions about the process of it, totally. Uh, totally allowed to be talked about there. So I probably have a few words to say about that. Um, I'm looking forward to talking about it. Um, remind me uh, of the date and time. Yes, yeah, so Wednesday, June 21st at 6.30 p.m. in Government Center. Looking forward to it. So we're gonna talk a little bit about a sober house application um, that came through the city council. Uh, and Tom is gonna introduce that for us, thank you. Uh, yeah, so this sober house application is proposed to be uh, basically converting an existing lodging house on Robin Street in Ward 8 into sober housing, which will also still legally be considered a lodging house and so no significant changes. Um, and this is brought forward by this man, Jeff Gershman, uh, who works with the Mass Alliance of Sober Housing, which is the certifying body in Massachusetts that certifies that sober houses are legit and operating well. Um, and this is a proposal to create a, I believe a 20 bed um, sober house in Robbins, uh, on Robin Street in Waltham. And what that means is that this sober house is for people who have already been through the addiction recovery process, mostly according to Jeff, and that it is for people who are simply done with like the medical intervention and simply want a community where they can be around people who are also on a sober journey with them. They can be in a fully sober environment and that they are close to um, jobs and transit, which is why Jeff was particularly spoke in favor of this location on Robin Street near Moody Street as like a good place for a sober house. Uh, and at, when I say sober house, this also means it's not just alcohol addiction. It also involves people according to him uh people recovering from drugs as well like uh the sober house doesn't discriminate in that regard um yeah that's a great synopsis uh better than better than what uh, i could have uh, tried to do um but while that sounds probably to most people like a good idea it was actually met with a lot of contention uh, i think it had like four or five um, neighbors of that spot come out and speak in an opposition to it um <laughs> As a sober person myself, I'm celebrating two years sober in, in August. Um, I like have a lot of feelings about this, uh, a lot of feelings about the things that were said about people in recovery. Um, but what I can say is that there's just a lot of misconceptions about sobriety. And also, yeah, Tom mentioned the sober houses. This is not for people like in active addiction. This is not for people that like are just off the street. This is like the final stage uh, for people before they uh, get a house themselves, before they go back with their family, before um, you know they join the general population, um, and so the the concerns of you know safety, I think, are totally overblown. I think you're going to have those concerns about safety, uh, you know, just just as much, if not more, than, the, than your neighbor who drinks uh, every single day uh, that, you know, just has a home. As you know, those, those dangers exist, um, whether or not, you know, it's someone in recovery or not. Um, and, and yeah, so definitely just some disturbing comments. I think I wanna sprinkle a little of them in right here. Um, just like some of, the, some of the ones that I thought were particularly heinous. Property um, values, I did my research and I found out that you know, property values can be uh, impacted, you know, 20% uh, in some cases. So, you know, this is a brand new house. We invested our own money in it. You know, we are young people. So, you know, we're also trying to, up, uh, you know, come up in our careers and our lives. They're going to move in there 
I have to sell. I have seven great children. That was my dream home. If they're gonna come in, I'm done. That's what I can say. I have seven great children. I'm 61 years old. I don't wanna move. I wanna see that place like Cambridge. And also I want to include, um, I don't know, Tom, you probably weren't expecting uh, us to include this, but Tom actually was at the meeting um, and uh, spoke a little bit about it. So I'd love to include um, Tom's words here. Um, but primarily, I just want to say that um, I think addiction, like the strongest of us are those who have like challenged it and overcome it. I think providing a housing place for people to realize opportunity is a wonderful thing. And I realize this isn't something that is immediately in my backyard, but I know that is something that if it was in my backyard, it is something I would support. I know I would have neighbors who would be against it because there's always people, no matter where it is, it will always be the wrong space. But if we want to make a change and have a positive impact on human lives, rather than just this marginal impact on property values, you know, this is how it's done one step at a time, one sober house at a time. Thank you. And yeah, so this uh, this goes to committee, um, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that there is a better reception there. Although I'm sure there will be uh, people, the same people there uh, that spoke out against it. So I'm hoping some supporters uh, come to that meeting. Um, and so, um, so just for clarification on where they are in the process, so this was like an introductory. It was a public hearing uh, specifically. Um, for the sober house, which is why those speaking against the sober house were able to speak, and that is why I was able to speak there as well. Um, so yeah, next up is that like further committee reference stuff where um, the dialogue will continue. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth between the city councilors and uh, Jeff Gershman, where he was clarifying a lot of these questions. That's where a lot of information came out that, you know, this is like a place where people who have already been through the recovery process and just are looking for a sober environment um so yeah, this is very early in the process um one thing that's worth noting though is that like at the end of it uh when the whole meeting was over um kathy and harris was actually like going around in the audience like trying to give her no number uh to those who spoke in opposition of the sober house um saying she wanted to follow up so this may be a similar scenario to um to maybe like healthy wall fam where she may be an active element, sort of like quietly trying uh, to get what certain people that I don't care for would call undesirable like populations out of her neighborhood. Um, it may just be part of that broader behavioral trend that Kathy Ann Harris has and yeah. what she's willing to support and what she's willing to oppose. Yeah, certainly there's a track record for Kathy Ann. I wouldn't say having an issue with vagrancy, but certainly mimicking the talking points of the neighbors in her ward that are concerned about vacancy. That's what I can say. That is, that is just the truth. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to see. Um, and, and I guess I, the only other point that I wanted to bring up that we couldn't get to is that um, John, is that his name? John, right? Jeff. Jeff, Jeff, Jeff uh, Grisham. Um, he's a, uh, he already has a home like this uh, in Quincy. He's on the board of uh, sober house um, groups. He uh, he just knows what he's talking about when he does this stuff. And he clearly like knew what he was getting into when he when he walked up onto the stage. He knew that people were going to say these things because he's been through these things before. Um, but I just um, I uh, was really thought he spoke very well. And um, if you have the time. Uh, you should definitely watch that meeting. Yeah, so if you want to learn more beyond just watching the city council meeting, the advice he gave everyone, uh, so we'll give you as well, if you want to learn more about sober housing, is you can go to uh, Massachusetts Alliance for Sober Housing. They have a website online. Just Google it, MA Sober Housing, or no, M-A-S-H, soberhousing.org. Uh, you can learn a lot more about what they do, um, what sober house means for our community and how they operate in Massachusetts. And so the last thing we're going to talk about, uh, I think, is um, I think the only resolution that had to do with climate change this entire session um, came through and left the city council uh, in record speed. Um, and so, uh, Josh, if you want to introduce this, that'd be amazing. 
Yeah, so um, this was a resolution that Councillor Bradley MacArthur submitted with uh, Councillors Paz and Darcy um, co-signing, which is starting to become a very familiar team for good ideas that then get shot down. Um, so uh, the city, the state sets building codes um, and they set building codes for energy efficiency, which are based on international standards. And municipalities have the option to then adopt a stricter um, building code, which is a stretch code. And the way they work is they set a rating system, a point system for a building where um, you have to uh, get a certain amount of points depending on how big your building is. You need a certain amount of points in order to build. And so it's very complicated, but basically you get points for being energy efficiency. And the, the, what these newer codes are pushing is basically to get rid of gas and oil. And so, for example, instead of having an air conditioner that runs on electricity and a heating that runs on gas. In the future, you might have one system that's electric and produces both heat and cold air, and that's a lot more energy efficient. It also, according to the state, saves money for the homeowner that they actually um, spend a lot less um, once they have these things um, in their home. And this would apply to, it applies to both homes and businesses, although most of the discussion was about homes. Right. And um, it applies to new construction as well as renovation. So if you renovate your home and you're putting on an addition and there's something in the existing home that's not up to code, you have to change that too in order to do the addition. Um, so the Waltham in the past has adopted the stretch codes. So when Councillor um, Bradley MacArthur submitted this, it was to adopt the updated stretch codes based on the updated state guidelines. She probably wasn't expecting this to be as controversial as it was, but she submitted it. It was sent to the Public Works and Public Safety Committee. Um, Councillor LaFauci, who's on that committee, set it up so that she was there, and a person from the city building department was there. He questioned them on it. Basically, the city building inspector confirmed what LaFauci was kind of asking him to confirm, which is that this is difficult. This is going to make things more difficult for um, people who want to renovate their homes or new construction. And they think that the new number uh, is a maybe an unreasonably high number. And Councillor LaFauci made the point that this could um, deter people from, you know, if a family wants to stay in Waltham, but they need to add an addition for their kids or their grandparents, they might not be able to do that because it might be too expensive. And that would somehow make it, oh, he said something, this will make it impossible to live in Waltham which seemed like a little exaggeration. But he also said it would cost the city money because people would stop renovating their houses in the city. They'd stop paying for building permits and the city makes money off building permits. Um, but probably the most interesting thing he said was that you know, this is a code that's a set of standards that's been adopted by Massachusetts and California. Other states are not necessarily where we're at in terms of the goals they're setting. And he made the point that, um, and we'll show the clip, that, um, you know, it's there's no point doing this unless every country and every uh, state is going to do it. And he made the point that uh, COVID, the world shut down in three days for COVID, so maybe we could get together to do this, which is totally false. That wasn't the timeline of COVID shutdowns at all. They happened on totally different schedules in different countries. So I don't know why he brought up COVID, um, I guess to make the point that it was possible that the world could solve climate change, but they're not going to because they haven't already. And he said fossil fuels are not going away. So he asked the building um, person to sort of confirm this. He asked the building, he said that fossil fuels aren't going away, right? And the building person said, well, I'm 100% Italian. And if my mom saw me using an electric stove, she would be very disappointed. Uh, 21 that you can't, in 2030, it's gonna be all fossil fuel is gone for new construction anyway. And by 2050, it's, everything's gonna be electric. So, um, I don't know why. I mean, we're seven years early trying to do this. I mean, I don't know. What the I mean, that's somebody throwing a dart at a dartboard saying by 2030 we're going to be fossil fuel independent, but. <laughs> but that's just the United States. What are we doing with the rest oh, of the country? that's Massachusetts. World? Okay, so that's Massachusetts. Yeah. What is the rest of the country doing? They're following California. 
Okay, so we'll have Massachusetts and California and all the states in between. What are they doing? You know, I, I <laughs> what is the rest of the what is I'm just I'm just I'm just trying to thinking out loud now. It's like, what is the rest of the world doing? And I agree there could be a plan because the world shut down. In a matter of three days, the world did. We all got together because there was a massive pandemic and the world was able to shut down in three days. But now to have Massachusetts say, we're going to do this, but the rest of the country is going to be like, great, more gas, more oil for us. We, we haven't really fixed the problem. And if you look around this room, obviously the people at home can't see it. By getting rid of fossil fuels, gas and electric, you're, you're, you're basically eliminating the engine for what controls everything. But basically everything in this room and everything that was used by people to get here depends on fossil fuels. So fossil fuels are not going away. Correct? I grew up, my mother was 100% Italian. She sees my stove going on electric. And if you, have, if you have an EV vehicle that runs on electricity, great. But the majority of the components for that vehicle are contingent on fossil fuels. Yeah, the problem is, is now you got to update your electrical system to a 100 amp to a 200 amp, and I'm hearing from hers right is that that might even not be enough either. You might have to go to a 400 amp. A 400 amp that right now the meters are on yeah, back order yeah, two yeah. years because they come from China. It wasn't necessarily he was being put on the spot because the, the you know, Councillor LaFauci was asking him to confirm his opinion on a geopolitical issue that's definitely beyond his job as director of the building department. Um, so he was in a tough position, but he came up with a very interesting answer. Um, but what happened was Councillor LaFauci uh, asked this committee to file it with prejudice. Now, when you file something, that means you're not taking any further action on it. No one can interfere introduce it again for a year, unless you say file without prejudice, in which case they can reintroduce it again. But Fauci went beyond that to explicitly state that it's being filed with prejudice. That's what the committee voted to do. It went back to the full council at the council meeting. Um, Councilor Bradley MacArthur made sort of a last minute attempt to recommit it to a committee. That didn't work. So they voted to file it with prejudice. It is now a done deal. Waltham's not doing this and not reconsidering it for at least a year. Um, so what was interesting to me about what Councillor LaFauci said is that um, actually, you know, he is now sort of to the right of the oil industry on this. Um, the oil industry, even, even the oil companies now admit that climate change is real and that it's a real problem and that we have to reduce fossil fuels. Um, in the past four or five years, this is something I know about from my day job, that's a big shift that's happened the past four or five years. All of the American and European oil companies have rebranded themselves as energy companies and they've started investing money in other types of energy as well as um, climate mitigation like carbon sequestration. The amount of money they're investing is not huge compared to what would be needed to actually solve the problem, but it is pretty huge when you consider that in the past they were just in denial about this. So if Councillor Fauci had called up uh, ExxonMobil or Shell's public relations department and asked for advice on what to say in this meeting, they would have told him not to say what he said. You don't say, you know, just give up on it. Client fossil fuels are not going away. And there's a good reason for that because a few years ago, the United Nations came out with a report saying if we don't drastically reduce emissions in a very short amount of time, it will have catastrophic effects. We already see more um, natural disasters, which leads to refugee crises, which leads to wars and authoritarian governments and resource shortages. And so when you say to a young person, fossil fuels are not going away, what you're saying to them is you have no future. And when you say to people with kids, fossil fuels aren't going away, what you're saying is your kids have are, are destined to live in a worse world than the one you live in. And there's nothing we're going to do about it. And that's why more and more politicians and private companies are unwilling to say that. And part of the reason the oil industry had to change was because they couldn't get engineers because smart young people don't want to work for an oil company. They want to be part of the uh, solution, not the problem. And so they had to do this rebranding because they were having a brain drain. That was part of the reason. But anyways, you know, so this, uh, his comments here put him to the right of the oil companies. 
and he had him saying something which to him doesn't sound extreme, but to most people under the age of 30 sounds very extreme because they're being told, you know, you're going to live in a worse world. You're going to live in a worse world than your parents live in. And nobody believes there's anything that can be done about it. So that's pretty disappointing. This was a pretty small step that Waltham could take in the right direction. And now we're not. And, you know, there's the frustration that we've done it in the past. So why was it a big deal this time? Is it because of who was putting it forward? Same thing with the bride resolution. Is it, you know, if certain people's names are the, on the resolution, are other counselors just avoiding it, you know, regardless of how much good it does? So uh, this was a pretty disappointing thing. Uh, I don't know if it's technically true that there are no other discussions about climate change this year, because there have been discussions about things like bikes, which could be helpful, but those things also have been pretty much blown off by having them sent to the master plan committee, which never meets as far as we know. So uh, this has a council now that has made it very clear they have no interest doing anything about climate, even small basic things that the state is recommending. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if that makes a difference in this year's election, or if the people who are voting are still people who are old enough that they're not really concerned about living in the dystopia that we've been creating. Uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, I think you uh, actually covered most of what I wanted to say. I mean, just reiterating, I think it's such a bad take for him to say, because the rest of the world or the West, even the rest of the United States isn't doing this thing, that we shouldn't be doing it because it won't do anything. It's like, that's not how people work. That's not how things work. Like we should be leading in things like- Or well, another way to say is that is how it's worked for 30 years. The yeah. Reason, I mean, he's demonstrating why though, he's showing us exactly why the world hasn't solved global warming or climate change because people say, well, why should I do that if everyone's not doing it? Yeah, and it's that, more complex yeah. because like, you know, one country might need coal more and maybe you said S was willing to give up coal and China is it, but it all comes down to that. Why should I fix the problem if you're not fixing the problem? Yeah. And people have known about climate. That's the other thing. Scientists have known about climate change since the 1970s. And not only that, but the predictions they were making in the 70s and 80s about um, global CO2 levels and global temperature have proven to be pretty accurate still, even though they were making these things with like the earliest computers. <laughs> it's basically, so there's already whole generations that have gone by that failed to solve this problem. And young people hearing the current generation saying it's not reasonable to solve this problem is, is very frustrating. Yeah, truly a bad take especially coming from a city like Waltham, which used to lead in a lot of ways, but just now it's just like, why, why, why? If no one else is doing it. If, I wonder if, you know, two, 200 plus years ago, if people were like, why would we, why would we revolutionize the, 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 um, the, man, the manufacturing uh, business? Not everyone is doing that. Why would we do that? Uh, we wouldn't have uh, built the mill um, and, is, is we used to be a city that leads, and now uh, with our current leadership, it doesn't it just doesn't look that way. Um, and then also, I guess one other one, um, one other thing I want to point out is just again a bad take of him talking about if if you add on to the building, then you'll have to adhere to this, and you'll have to redo your entire house. But the truth is, if you double the square footage of your house, then you would have to come up to code with this. And he was saying like, oh, you know, if you know, if you're in Waltham and you want to add a room, uh, you know, if, if mom if mom leaves and you want to redo the basement, uh, then you'll have to you'll have to do this. It's like if you double the square footage of your house, then you have to come up to code with it. It's like adding a room is not going to do that. Um, and so I thought that was disingenuous to say that. That, that actually makes me think of recently, I was going through um, property assessment data and you see this trend where you have, for the most part, like assessed value for homes lines up with how much they're sold for, with the exception of like $600,000 homes being sold for 1.3 million because of, um, because of renovations like that. Um, so he's just essentially just looking out for those specific people, those specific constituents, and that's about it. I'm not surprised at all to hear that. Yeah. Uh, and also your discussion about um, how little the city council seems to be talking about climate change and this may be like the only like climate 
ordinance that's coming or climate ordinance resolution that's come in front of them. That makes me think back to the last time I can recall, um, like climate change being like the term climate change being invoked in the city council. Uh, it was last fall, and I can't remember if it was LaFauci or LeBlanc who said it, but regardless, both of them voted against these stretch codes um, and they voted to file without uh, to file the uh, resolution with prejudice. But one of them had said in discussing the upcoming bike chain, uh, the upcoming bus changes that were coming to Waltham, uh, they said, um, I cannot, I, they said something along those lines of them having doubts about supporting buses coming through their neighborhoods uh, because they had low density neighborhoods. And, you know, if you have empty buses driving down the streets, that's just worsening climate change. Oh um, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so yeah, I remember that because it's just such a ridiculous statement because yeah. yes, single occupancy vehicles are damaging our, our environment, but the perpetrator of that is not buses. It is large, above and beyond is due to personal automobiles and cars. And the fact that the only time climate change is really uh, invoked by these counselors is to shoot down pro-climate agenda item such as better bus service which is better for the environment it just shows like a fundam fundamental unseriousness of our current city council to oh, yeah. the current climate crisis and it's just like a rhetorical a rhetorical phrase that they'll call upon everyone else well but when it comes to actually doing action to you know support the climate and improve climate resiliency and sustainability in waltham you know when it comes to the stretch codes they're more than happy to just vote against it and shut down conversation for the next year to come. Yeah, it just goes back to um, something that I like uh, bringing up that that literally nothing matters but your agenda. For a lot of these people, I wouldn't say all, but for a lot of these people, nothing matters. The truth doesn't matter. The, what you believe in doesn't matter. What is your agenda? What is going to get you elected? Um, and wh whatever you can use to do that, they're going to use it. Um, and so... It doesn't surprise me. But yeah, I do remember that comment. It was so gross. So disingenuous. <laughs> it's uh, so ridiculous. It makes no sense. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think if there's nothing else, that will do it for this debrief. Um, next city council, uh, next week is, is not uh, a city council meeting. Um, the week after will be committees. Um, I'm not sure if we'll, we'll talk then um, or if we'll wait for the, um, for the full city council uh, to chat. Um, but we will, um, we'll see you soon. Thank you, uh, Josh and Tom and, uh, Nick and Amanda who aren't on, but thank you for coming on. Looking forward to pride and we will see you all there. Thanks everyone. See ya.